Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from five exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alexis. From Belgium. Well, France today. Hello. Alessio. Hello. Audrey. Hello, everyone. Cara. Hello, from Germany. And I'm your host, Ben. Today, we're going to be talking about Shablam, A Fist of Dragonstones, Chakra, Tidal Blades, and Century Spice Road slash The Super... Alexis, what are you up to? Um, what am I up to? Well, right now I'm traveling to... I've traveled to Audrey's, and I've spent the last uh, few days playing Midera uh, extensively. I also had a, a quick game of uh, Destinies with uh, Audrey's boyfriend, and it was a, a lot of, and it was a, a lot of fun. Um, I don't think that I would uh, play Destiny again. I think that it was uh, it, it would be better if it was uh, more co-op oriented. But uh, it was it was nice to try it out. And um, well, about Midara, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, I'm sure. About Midara, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, otherwise I'm I'm doing pretty well. Um, and what about you, Carl? Um, well, um, as of right now, um, I still have summer break, so I have a lot of free time, and I actually got to I have a lot of free time, and I actually got to um, play several games. Um, I played Micro Macro Crime City finally, um, and Love Letter. I played Trial by Trolley, Railroad Inc and um, also tried out Flamecraft, which is right now on Kickstarter. I think when this episode is released, it's finished. But yeah, I tried it out on Tabletopia and it was a lot of fun, actually. Um, and yeah, apart from that, um, relaxing, trying not to think about returning back to school during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You mentioned, what was it Trial by Trolley? Yeah, I've not heard of this. Do, do just give us a little tell about this. That's a that, fascinating name. That's the Cyanide and Happiness second game, right? Uh, yeah, it's by Cyanide and Happiness. And Happiness second game, right? Uh, yeah, it's by Cyanide and Happiness. They make these um, web comics uh, with little regards to good taste and <laughs> such. So. Um, it's a party game where you basically take this uh, trolley problem. Okay, you have this trolley. A party game where you basically take this uh, trolley problem. Okay, you have this trolley going down the railroads and you come to a. Uh, I don't yeah. know the English word for it. So it's basically, there are two ways it can go. And on one part, there is, for example, uh, a small ch child and on the other one are three old people and you have to s decide who you kill basically and the dilemma. in this game the trolley problem yeah yeah and in this game in teams uh, you do this one player is always the one to decide which uh, rail they take in the end and they have conducted to take the other team's rail and basically kill everyone on there and um so you, you basically pile up cards to add value to your branch of the trolley so that it doesn't get picked. So you add a small child, then you add a mother of two, then you add a cat to go over the other branch. <laughs> yeah, the trolley problem's an old classic. That's, a, that's an interesting game. Not sure, not sure who I'd play that with, but um, I can imagine it'd be fun. It sounds... More fun than some of the bad taste ge games that are out there? Oh, yes. <laughs> you you should just rank them. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so we enjoyed it a lot. Um, it's, I mean, sure, it's, it's not always politically correct, um, but um, I think in, in most cases it's in good taste because um, it's does say no you don't want to kill any of those uh, people um, but you have to decide on someone um, except for the negative cards you also can add a card to the other rail of some with something that the person <laughs> there is a card the person that uh, invented microtransactions <laughs> <clears throat> and yeah 
there is some problems with um, playing it as a an European because um, we had uh, the starting lineup of the uh, Patriots or something. Who cares? What? <laughs> <laughs> And it was a negative card, so apparently people in America feel inclined to kill them. I don't know, but um, yeah. Um, so, um, Audrey, what about you? Well, uh, as Alexis said, the last two days we've been playing. Uh, said the last two days we've been playing uh, lots of Midara, so we, we've reached uh, chapter two, and we still have uh, tonight to play where we're going to try our first bounty. Uh, other than that, I finished the last scenario of Destinies with my boyfriend, and yeah, I have the same uh, with my boyfriend, and yeah, I have the same uh, experience as Alexis. Uh, I would rather it to be a cooperative game, and it's not a game that I want to replay. Uh, and I think that's it because due to the holidays uh, I haven't played a lot and uh, I haven't played a lot and due to my start of unemployment I got back into uh, the Guild Wars 2 video game and that's what I spent most of my time on. <laughs> yeah, I think we're kind of all in agreement with Destinies which seems to be, it's a decent system, it's a nice idea it's a decent system. It's a nice idea. Uh, for me, at least, I'd prefer some cooperative play and I'd prefer better written scenarios. Um, but I think it has potential. Yeah, I, I, li I like the, the system and how the statistic works and stuff like that. But at some point, I the statistic works and stuff like that. But at some point, I just stop, stop feeling uh, committed. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like my feelings as well. Yeah. And what about you, Alessio? What have you been doing? Uh, very, very late, the expansion for S Arcana. The first one, Lux at Tenebre, which was uh, translated in Italian uh, for the first time uh, uh, right now. And... Uh, so I played that uh, actually waiting to play with my group, uh, which is the with Reser Kana lately. Uh, I'm playing it with my wife, which is a bit exasperated of my <laughs> of my want of playing this this stuff. So I, I think that we will get uh, to play a bit of parks in the weekend with the kids. <laughs> And uh, this is basically not been a uh, long time. And uh, so, what about you, Fan? Well, when it comes to board games, um, we've been going through the uh, Vaporwave, uh, yeah, Vaporwave sort of selection. Um, every single box played realized was purple and blue. So, Dinosaur Island, which I was excited about getting this for a long time, and I still think it's a pretty good game. But I was very sad that all of the dinosaurs were plastic. I wanted little wooden dinosaurs, not stinky little plastic ones. Um, which is a real shame, because like everything in that game box is this for no reason. Um, Do you oh, mean that the dinosaurs are made of dead dinosaurs? Well, considering plastic isn't actually dead dinosaurs, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, Underwater Cities as well, played a bit. Uh, that is very crunchy and good, and I'm thinking about whether we get the expansion. Is very crunchy and good, and I'm thinking about whether we get the expansion or not. Um, played some Dream Crush with. Uh, uh, we had to ban Elijah Wood's card from play because he just kept winning everything. It was really easy whenever Elijah Wood was there. Um, it's just. Uh, uh, it was this first moment of. It's just. Uh, uh, it was this first moment of uh, playing, I, I can't remember, Francis, I think his character's name or something like that. And it's like, is that Elijah Wood? And then that's Elijah Wood. And sure enough, he's credited in the book. So uh, <laughs> once we got rid of him, things became a bit fairer. And most of all, we've been playing the Snallygaster situation. If you don't know the Ooh. role-playing book, uh, you'll know the trope, which is that 1980s kids on a bicycle, E.T., the Goonies, uh, Stephen King's It... Uh, and most things. recently, straight yes, and most recently, Stranger Things, um, kids on bikes cycle around dealing with monsters and mysteries. Uh, there are a bunch of them. The Snally Gaster is another. It's a it's an interesting game, um, especially 
for the person who plays as the monster because they also play as a lost kid. So they are kind of in charge of the bad guy, but also on your side. Uh, you need to find them and then do some other stuff to win and then do some other stuff to win. And it's hard work threading the needle as the lost kid because everything you do to try and help can also really badly harm the other players or lead them in the wrong direction. Um, so it's a, it's a tough one. It gets a bit less fun once you're revealed as the lost kid, but I still think it's a great cooperative game. It's fun once you're revealed as the lost kid, but I still think it's a great cooperative game. A bit heavier than horrified and within the same kind of feel. It's definitely worth one, one worth checking out. Um, so yeah, that's what the board games we've been playing. Um, and we're lining up to play some more Food Chain Mangate um, pretty soon. Pretty soon. Um, once we figure out a date. So great. Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty good. And I think things haven't been too uh, dramatic in the world of board games. Um, we've had a lot of drama recently, more back to normal-ish. There has been some very terrible stuff that happened. Um, a course involving the broken token. Um, I'm not sure how people have felt about that. It's been like, it took me a couple of days to recover after I read everything yeah. that happened. It was awful. Comment on the on the awfulness of the entire situation. That that's a real mess, and that's shameful to to, to read about that. And that that is sad news. Yeah. Well, I would say the silver lining from this um, is it. Unlike when we've seen accusations. Well, I would say the silver lining from this um, is it. Unlike when we've seen accusations of this in the video game community, where stuff's been brushed under the carpet, or right now Activision are actively trying to claim that California is lying. Um, instead, the community has stepped up together and been like, this isn't okay, and taken a swift community has stepped up together and been like, this isn't okay, and taken a swift action. Because um, too often, uh, it's a lot of like, oh, it's on burden of proof on the victim to prove otherwise, and this, oh, it's, you know, all sorts of hand washing and enabling. So I'm very happy to see so many prominent people step up. Yeah, it's pretty good to, to see... Uh support for the victims and uh, a lot of companies uh, distantiating themselves from broken token yeah as they say it's uh, nice to see some accountability once once uh, and for once i'd say it's um I, I especially appreciated Isaac uh, Childress because he's on the number one game on BGG right now and for a few years and uh, his words are counting are, are uh, meant to count to count a lot in this so great yeah. this so great yeah. I could see quite a few uh, innocent until proven guilty uh, arguments on Facebook, but uh, I could also see many people answering that who cares? It's not about court, it's about who companies choose to have business with and they can do whatever they choose to have business with and they can do whatever they want because it's companies. So, yeah, I, I was pretty happy to see uh, people differentiating the legal part which is something to the financial and companies business part which is complete business part which is completely another thing and which is what is happening right now yeah people often forget that um you can't just can't use that comparison because even if you try to talk about courts you have to remember that people can be found innocent in a criminal court and then still sued and found guilty in a in a civil court it's in case you don't think otherwise, it's it's turns out that between 80 and 90 percent of abuse claims are substantiated and true. So it, the burden, at least here in socially, is always on the person um, who is being accused to prove otherwise, really. Um, and kind of just dug the hole bigger. And deeper. Yeah. Yeah, I loved in that answer. Every, in, in the last years, while we are trying to work things out with my wife, every interaction that I've had in and outside of the workplace has been consensual. Uh, that <laughs> sentence, well, that, that was just, uh, I, I don't know the exact word to correct. Uh, pff, I'd say was, wrong. My mind was blown. <laughs> 
Yeah, uh, th- th- it's sad to laugh at this, but uh, I'd say that uh, this is the most blatant self-accusation I ever read in a tweet. And to which I would also say, if you read in a tweet. And to which I would also say, if you are a CEO, do not engage in consensual activities with your employees. That's best. Mm-mm. Absolutely yes. Well, our our hearts and thoughts go out to the um, the individual the individuals affected by this and any other individuals who've been affected by this and haven't spoken up yet whether they want to or not and um again you know applause to the way that the, a lot of the creators and designers and publishers have behaved through this um that's the kind of stuff i really want to keep see keep situations occurring i don't want those situations to happen but i do want people to behave in this manner okay well, um, I think we shall brush from uh, a fairly heavy topic to something very light and very silly. Uh, we're going to go to take a look at one of the big cultural phenomenons of the last decade, I think, or so, uh, in um, Drag Race, or totally not Drag Race, lip-syncing drag queen Euro sports-ish game uh, from Aaron van der Beek, who gave us the fantastic and amazing Castell back in 2018 which I reviewed recently, and I, I love that. That's this one of the most thematic sporting Euros. I, I love that. That's this one of the most thematic sporting Euros or thematic games I've played ever. So this one we played in Prototype, um, and it's a two to four player tableau building, set collecting, m- moving around a dance floor like a queen to the beating, moving around a dance floor like a queen to the beat of the music sort of affair with some very fun, silly, uh, made-up drag queens and a lot of uh, references and things like that to RuPaul's Drag Race, of course. So, uh, Alexis, would you like to tell us a little bit about... (laughs) Shablam! Uh, I really liked the game. I thought that the the theme was very strong into... uh especially the art but but everything uh the text uh, just um, the game mechanics it, it reflected pretty well um during the whole game i would uh i i could see that some players were doing better but i i still wasn't sure about the the final score so i like that the way the the different mechanics kind of obfuscate uh who's leading at the moment but i thought that the game was slight uh it, it was very enjoyable though yeah yeah it's it's listed on, on the board game geek website it's been 30 to 60 minutes and um maybe it'll get there in the end but that that's prototype, not what happened <laughs> no every game i've played has run past like towards two hours um which uh has felt a bit long but towards two hours um which uh has felt a bit long but uh aaron uh, I mentioned that to Aaron, and he said he's looking at uh, adjusting the time lengths, um, certainly, because you don't want it to outstay its welcome. I mean, a lip sync battle is a fast, punchy affair filled with high points and oohs and oh my goodnesses, filled with high points and oohs and oh my goodnesses and, and death drops. And um, you want the board game to reflect that. But uh, Alexis, yeah, I, I really loved how how the game obfuscates the winner. Um I thought that was fantastic, very enjoyable. Because you, yeah, like I said, I. Um, yeah, I but thought, ooh, you were not the one that lost. Yeah, but I was. <laughs> I was still. I, it, as far as I'm concerned, second place is just a fancy name for the first loser. So you know, I still. It, That's bad face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I didn't score much more than you. Um, uh, and you you were struggling. I was struggling. I was trying, but it was interesting. Every game I played has always had at least two people very tight or even in one game they were exactly the same scores which is pretty pretty interesting yeah uh, our game we had two close at the top and two close at the bottom yeah but uh yeah the, the, but uh yeah the, the idea of not being able to know who is the winner until it's over it reflects a bit the reality uh in the inspiration yeah absolutely the number of times you look and go I know who's won, and then RuPaul declares the other one a winner, and it's like, really? Were we were we watching the same lip sync? I'm not sure we were, 
but uh, that's that's part of the spectacle and joy. That's the magic of editing. Exactly, it's, it is, it is. So um, what you're doing, Jury Sublime, is there's a panel of four or five judges. Um, you're trying to impress, or five judges, um, you're trying to impress. Each one of them has a particular category that they care about for that lip sync. Now, there's, I think, 10 categories in the game and you'll have five of them randomly out each time. And those categories have three different cards in each of varying power. Um, you'll collect by moving around varying power. Um, you'll collect by moving around on the dance floor, uh, on the stage, I should say, lip sync stage. You'll be picking up rhinestones, which are basically coloured gems. Um, and you'll be spending those to activate cards that you've collected so there's basically three sets of currency in the game which basically three sets of currency in the game which is lips that you get when you pick up cards rhinestones you get when you're moving around and then the um cards themselves which you can uh, they go into your tableau where they power up your lip collection or they improve um you can discard them to help pay for or improve a lot of maneuvering yeah I, your first game when you play will almost certainly be f several turns of like I'm, I'm not sure what i'm doing i'm i don't know if i'm if i'm getting anywhere i'll just guess i'll just take these i i really like the way that um getting cards help you get lips but you strike and it's a bit different from the usual way that um engine builder function um I, I thought that, uh, that was interesting in the game. Yeah, yeah. I I was thinking that myself today. Where I was thinking what I quite find quite interesting is how some of the cards encourage you to build up a big tableau of card cards in backup to power up your lips and power up your moves, and then others encourage you to spend them. So you get this kind of ebb and flow where your tableau is quite strong and giving you lots of bonuses, and then maybe you've spent it all and you're you're back down, giving you sort of peaks and troughs, which is. Uh, it's a hard one to navigate. Yeah, I think um, person hard one to navigate. Yeah, I think um, personally from the mechanical side, it's I think it's really great. And basically everything you just said, um, there is a lot to decide. Uh, there are pros and cons to each decision. It's not like you look at it and know, oh yeah, I have to do this because there is no this because there is no other sensible thing to do. Um, it's useful to keep cards in your tableau because you will get more lips when you take new cards however by spending the cards you get more powerful moves and um, so yeah that's really interesting i found all the mechanics my personal problem apart from the game length which is apparently addressed by the designer right now um, i felt the theme went into the background um, while playing, I didn't really look at the names of dance moves or, you know, try to imagine what my figure actually does there on the stage. I just looked, okay, I need these two gems and then I can play this card and get these points. And um, that's where I felt if and um, that's where I felt if you want to have this theme and the theme in the foreground it doesn't it does need to be a lighter game and um from the theme side i kind of missed um the idea um, from the theme side i kind of missed um the idea of you know cueing dance moves um it was like okay every time i play a card the figure does one move and then another player's turn. And when it's my turn again, I can do one move. So. I think I get what you're saying. So uh, it, it could have alternatively been something where you like play a card and make a move, and then you play another card and you make another move following on from that and kind of a bit combo building. Yeah, that's what I would have expected from, you know, the pitch of the game that I have like this combo building. It's, it's, it's fine what it is, it's just, was what I was expecting and what I would have wished for the theme because I feel like the mechanics could be f as well with any other theme. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I think 
I think I agree as well, because Castell is phenomenal for the theme. It's tied, spend all your time rearranging your tower, trying to strengthen it and figure out what you're, um, what you're doing and going after festivals and everything. That uh, um, I, I did hope that the theme would be more in the front in this game. Um, I also, I'm really surprised how crunchy it is. Like, you're talking triple digit final point scores. I'm surprised how crunchy it is. Like, you're talking triple digit final point scores in a typical game for everyone. It's, and, and the number of decisions you have to make a turn, it's, uh, it, for, for me, it's almost fatiguing where I'm sat there and I'm like, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And I'm having trouble finding direction at times. Um, when I'm having trouble finding direction at times, um, when we played, initially I was like, oh, I'm going to build up a big um, tableau of a bunch of certain rhinestones and that will help me fuel my lips and I'll I'll go for that. And then Alexis scores so many points off me having cards that I was like, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. And I dumped my all my card time because I couldn't keep up if people were going to keep scoring off me having a big um, tableau, which admittedly that's that particular move set influence in the game. But yeah, it was... Um, yeah, the only time I do really remember it's a a, um, a lip sync is when I'm moving my figure across the board and it feels crowded. Yes, I I yeah, like yeah. that point, and I'm guessing that it must feel very different for with four players um, than with only two, right? Yeah, it's um it's a different beast with two, and I think the game might just be tighter at two player where it all works just be tighter at two player where it all works a bit better because you spend less time sitting waiting until your next turn so it feels more punchy that you collect less slip tokens so it's shorter so this might be for me at least a game i pick up just exclusively for playing two players and going head to head um maybe i'm doing two players and going head to head um maybe i don't know yet i i all i do know is i definitely want to back it um i think there is like a really great game in here once the last few bits and pieces are chiseled out. Um, but uh, I, I I do get uh, fatigued trying to keep a track of everything that's scoring in a given turn. Uh, yeah, speaking of scoring, I think it's good to mention the uh, the crunchiness of uh, the, the final score calculation, um, which felt a bit odd with the type of game that it was. Yeah, it doesn't feel thematic although it does kind of you've got some um desire tokens from various judges because you've achieved certain goals they wanted and maybe you've scored a 10 from them because you've managed to achieve at least a 10 point move within that given category and so you sit down first of all if you've got tens across the boards your lowest scoring category doubles its point essential then you check your lyric colors um which if you you score more and more for the more different colors you have. Now, one of the fighting things in this is when you're collecting lyric tokens, actually, whenever you collect a given lyric token, you score all of the previous ones of the same color at the same time adding onto that. You score all of the previous ones of the same color at the same time adding onto that move. So you're torn in two directions as to trying to collect one of each color and also instead, do I just go for like loads of yellows and loads of greens and not worry about it? Then you score every single judge's category, and if you score higher than anyone else, you get a judge de judge's category, and if you score higher than anyone else, you get a judge desire token extra. Then you score bonuses for having complete sets, one, two, three, four, five of each judge desire set. Then you score each individual judge desires separately. And oof, that's like a lot. I, every time I calculated this, of the, the score sheet that comes on Tabletop Simulator into a spreadsheet and just let it auto-calculate it. Because it's it's big numbers. I, I I could see myself wanting an app to play this on Tabletop. Yeah, I, I was completely lost uh, during all the game because uh, there are so many ways. And uh, as Kara said, yeah, at some, at some point I... I stopped caring about the theme. I was just, oh, okay, so these colors give me something, but there are also these colors. And yeah, there are different uh, objectives that go in uh, different directions. And I did not know what to pick because there were some, some uh, but I mean, that, that, com that gives the feel of a, yeah, of a four-way lip sync when it can be uh, chaotic. But I really did not know what I was doing most of the time. And... 
It's a game where I wa I will like to take the cards at some point and just shuffle through them and watch them take the cards at some point and just shuffle through them and watch them and say, oh, this one, oh, yeah, that's funny, the, the, the illustration is nice, blah, blah. And at another time I will play, but I cannot link it uh, at the same time because I have... I need to calculate and to concentrate and to focus too much on how to play the game, basically, that I cannot, basically, that I cannot afford the mental time to... Uh, enjoy the theme yeah i think i think we could all agree this isn't something you play with a player who's prone to uh oh analysis paralysis because oh, no. they will oh, no. they will be stuck in the middle of the stage oh frozen. please don't show that game to my boyfriend <laughs> <laughs> that one uh i definitely want to to play this again because i think that um the second and maybe third uh time i play it i might be able to better envision what my actions are going to uh to link to uh, i i think that uh, the more play you have with definitely yeah I, um, I agree i would not mind another another game uh to see more and to say oh now that i understand exactly uh how i score lips uh how it can pile up to give me more lips when i pick a card how i can power up my moves with can power up my moves with an already played card oh and now that I have played, I also understand the powers of the drag queen that I picked. Because when we played, at first I picked a drag queen and I had no idea what her uh, power was. And as the game progressed, I was like, oh, 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 and I would have done some things uh, completely. And I would have done some things uh, completely different uh, had I understood her powers uh, earlier. Yeah, steep learning curve, I think is fair to say. And on that, I would also say it, we could really have done with some reference cards uh, for stuff like what all the goals are, because some of those symbols is quite quite hard to get to grips with. Get to grips with all of the different um, judge desire goals that are going on. Um, play any dance move or in play any dance move in any stage area of the given colour looks almost the same as play any dance move of a given colour within the matching stage area and admittedly it's just one one word really changing and added to the concept but the ones that were move three spaces and land on a stage space of a given colour or on a rhinestone of a given colour I could immediately click with those and the rest always took a bit of time to think about and I, I found during the turn I just have to pick something and be like can I do this and, and just try and do that, whether it was good or not. There was just so. But that said, every time I finished it, within a day or two, I find myself going, you know what? I, I bet I could do better this time. I bet I bet I could manage to get tens across the board and navigate everything a bit better. And I go off and have another go. And I go off and have another go. Okay, so that was Shablam from Aaron van der Beek, who also gave us the fantastic Castell. You can read a review written by myself on that board game on Board Game Geek, and by myself on that board game on Board Game Geek in the uh, game category. And we're going to go now from rhinestones across to an entirely different kind of stone. Um, rhinestones, as we all know, come from Rhine. Um, so these ones instead uh, come from dragons. So, uh, Audrey. Would you like to tell us about Fist uh, Come From Dragons? So, uh, Audrey, would you like to tell us about Fist of Dragonstones? Yes, of course. Uh, Fist of Dragonstones, it's not a game that I like, but it's a game that my boyfriend likes, and I thought I would uh, give an homage to him by uh, speaking about it. Uh, <laughs> this is a game uh, which has Bruno Fe... <laughs> this is a game uh, which has Bruno Feiduti and Michael Schacht as designers. Or is it Schacht? Um, and it has been published by Death of Wonder. It's a game which, uh, where you have to score three points. The first player which has three points wins the game, and the points are three points wins the game, and the points are scored by exchanging gems of uh, colors, which are red, blue, and yellow, to points. 
So the game uh, has two uh, different steps. The first step is an auction step, where the different player is an auction step, where the different players will bid uh, coins that they have uh, hidden initially, and they take the coins in the palms of their hands, and they will use these coins to bid for the cards in a in a specific order. The cards will uh, give them powers to get dragons get dragon stones spend dragon stone for points uh this kind of things steal dragon stones to other etc and all in different combinations so you will take your coins there are different types of coins fairy coins silver coins gold coins which all get uh, replenished um at different um you go through the auction in the order of cards some cards uh are here every single turn and there is another deck of cards which at every turn you add some of them into the auction pool so any uh, game will be different uh, to each other due to these extra uh, cards at each the card and trigger the point scoring trigger the uh, gemstone the dragon stone um, winning etc and that plays in a few turns generally five turns so which i think makes you see 15 of the extra cards where there might be more than 40 uh, so that's 40 uh, so that's why the, the games are all different to each other and, and basically that's the concept of the game really you do the auction you score or not score or get the dragon stones at each turn and it goes on why I don't like this game is because I don't understand anything about auctions most of the times and uh, anything about auctions most of the times and uh, how to do combos. So that's um, and also I don't deal well with games where I could psychologically think oh he picked that card the previous turn so this turn he's going to want this one. That's not something that I am uh, able to do. Maybe you're not with us and uh, that'll get you to grips with auctions. And yeah. also a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Mother Nart and Ra and Medici. They, they, uh, yeah, they, they are all cool games. Uh, Was that ironic or not? No, not at no, all. No, no, no. Uh, Modern Art is a wonderful way to get to grips with how auctions work. And uh, purely auction, you know. So it's, it's a fantastic game. I, I want to say the pedigree on the designers of this game is incredible. Um, Bruno has got Mystery of the Abbey, Queen's Necklace... Diamant, Mission Red Planet, um, and Michael has like uh, Uwari, um, Coloretto, Zuguretto. He even designed Scotland Yard, which I know we're going to talk about at some point in the future because I love hidden movement games, and that one's pretty much the daddy of it. Yeah, please, t- please let's talk about the hidden movement games. <laughs> anyway, uh, to, to to get back to to the game, I uh, to, to to get back to to the game, I think that we have to cut the game some slack because it's uh, basically a twenty-year-old game or something like that, and uh, actually it did uh, a good job with the. Uh, with a blind auction, actually, it did a, a good job with a with a blind auction because you have that thing which is fairy gold, which basically comes back. So it basically mitigates the worst part of this kind of auctioning. Yeah, it's not a game I've ever had a chance to play. Jeremy, our Patreon, and my boyfriend. I, I wasn't too bothered with the auction mechanics because everything was narrative, and yeah, that wasn't bothering me. But with the Feast of Dragon Sun, the fact that it's auctions yeah. to a mechanical end, that's what bothered me. Yeah, the, the, the main difference with that is that is in King's Dilemma, stones because mm. you only get the fairy gold back. And that's the kind of cool part of tra- of strategy Jizing, which I expect from a, a game from these designers. So, smart. Yeah, that's a game where I don't suffer from uh, analysis paralysis because as I have no idea what I'm doing, I just pick things that run on <coughs> very fast, but I have no idea what I'm doing. Well, at some point I will say, oh, I think I need a yellow gemstones right now. And I try to get one, but <laughs> that's, uh, yeah, that's my chance when I play this game. Yeah, um, I have to say... Uh, I I never um, I played this game a lot of time ago, but uh, I I never um, I played this game a lot of time ago, 
but I, I think that uh, although the, the time listed is 45 minutes, I think that no game lasted less than an hour. I, I mostly played the four players. Yes. Than an hour. I, I mostly played the four players. Yeah, that's pretty respectable for a game of this. I was just looking. Um, it had a 2018 reprint and update for Fist of Dragonstone's Tavern Edition to speed up the game and uh, add a load of additional special character cards, apparently, to speed up the game and uh, add a load of additional special character cards, apparently. Yeah, D didn't play that, though. And a much bigger box as well. Got to get those big boxes in. If you if you're not selling the customers air, what are you doing? <laughs> selling the customers air, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, my boyfriend has the uh, old uh, edition. Well, actually, my parents have my boyfriend's uh, old edition <laughs> somewhere in my cupboards there. Uh, but yeah, the the box is a, is way smaller. Yeah, and the. And in French, it's Les Pierres du Dragon, the Stones of the Dragon. You know what? I prefer that name. Fist of Dragonstones, um, there's a lot of things you could say about that. The kindest one I'll say is it reminds me of Fist of the North Star, as the name goes. But uh, Which is cool! <laughs> it, uh, German, it's called Drachenfaust, which is translated just Dragon Fist. That's cool as well. There are no stones in the German title. <laughs> Yeah, so that's one game where translations make it better. I mean, not many games can boast of that. <laughs> no, they can't. They, they are being sort of a filler game to just pop out at the beginning of a, or end of a session or perhaps play somewhere when you're well, killing a little bit of time with some people. Um, but yeah. you kill yeah. one hour with that. <laughs> well, you know. I, I in in my case, that would be the end of the evening when I am getting tired and I just don't want to play anymore. Sounds perfect. You uh, you had another game you were going to talk to us about, didn't you? That also involves uh, nice shiny objects. Yes, because I love shiny objects. Ooh. Who uh, doesn't? It is Chakra. Uh, Chakra is a game which is about gems again. Uh, again, but this time there are more colors. There are seven colors, I think. Yes, seven. Um, and you will pick gems uh, in a um, picking uh, board and then you will organize them on your individual board in order to fill your colored chakras. That individual board in order to fill your colored chakras. That's the, the objective of the game. Each chakra can uh, be filled with three gems. When a chakra has been filled with the three gems of the same color than the chakra, the chakra is considered as filled and then is ignored for chakra. The chakra is considered as filled and then is ignored for the gems movement uh, mechanics. Players will take turn uh, picking gems first, uh, initially at the first turn in the picking board, putting them on their board, and then board, putting them on their board, and then the next turns they will be able to do actions which are picking other gems, moving gems on their board according to some uh, different uh, possibilities, and or um, meditating, which uh, gives them their action back, their actions back, and allow their actions back and allow them to see the points that each chakra uh, can get at the end of the game if the chakra is full. The thing is that each player has five actions. When the player puts the gems picked on the picking board and they put them into a chakra token near the chakra. So that action token is locked until the chakra has been filled. So, filled. <laughs> so there is uh, an idea that yeah you want to put gems directly into the chakras but if you do that too much at some point playing one move uh, token playing one of a move token then meditating then one move token one move token then meditating so there is a balance to find between putting gems directly into a chakra and having enough actions to move them now very yeah, now there is a picking rule when you pick because the three gems in a colon. 
free is the total of games uh, in of gems in the colon. If you pick free gems, they have to be all of different colors. If there is a black gem, which is the exception gem, in the colon, you have to pick it. So if, for instance, there is a colon with a dark, pick it. So if, for instance, there is a colon with a dark blue, a light blue, and a black, and you want to pick the dark blue, or the dark blue and the light blue, or just the light blue, you have to pick the black anyway. And the black uh, gems are dead. Uh, basically gems they are like a parasites to your inner uh, zen inner uh, zen and these gems if you manage to get them to the bottom of the board you can then either keep them for points at the end of the game one extra point per gem that stays here or convert them to uh, gems of any color that you decide that starts on the top of your board and, and you gain extra uh, point for one player, which is the one that has the most, uh, the biggest amount of chakras filled, starting from the bottom one. And at the end, you're, depending on your score, you get graded uh, depending on your Zen level. And I think that this final grade with a uh, thematic addition uh, to the game, are you a Zen Grandmaster or just a student? I think that's a very fun uh, addition to the game. Yeah, please, please note that it's very thematic that since the game stops, uh, uh, makes uh, your last turn uh, when uh, you get to five, cha to five chakras uh, balanced, you can never get to seven chakras complete. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's a game that I really like, uh, also because all the components are beautiful. Uh, the little girls uh, which are meditating are all in pastel. The little girls uh, which are meditating are all in pastel colors. And so everybody, is, uh, even if the drawing in itself is the same, the colors uh, really make them unique. And, and it's, it's in a small box as well. It's not a game where you get air. <laughs> And where you get air. <laughs> and yeah, it's a game where I personally like to take my time and just move the, the gems around and take my time. And I cannot play it on uh, board game arena due to that reasons because I am always playing against people that want to rush and get and get to the end of the game and I just don't need to take their time. Or maybe my parents which don't really understand what they are doing so that we have the time. And I think that's where the game really uh, lends to its um, name and the mechanics go with the theme uh, where you may want to take your time. It's a game to chill. So um, there are two different covers for the game and um, I really like the old cover from 2019 but apparently the new French and German edition from 2021 has this weird green cover that's not as nice, which I find sad because cover that's not as nice, which I find sad because the old one also has this meditating girl in pastel colors and it's just beautiful, but oh well. What, there is a new cover? I think I have the... I think I have the old one. Yeah, they, they do that, they do that uh, from time to time. Oh, oh, oh no, I, I do have the old one and I think it's much better. I don't like the new one. Yep, yep, me neither. <laughs> ba ba <laughs> basically, uh, for the listeners, we are uh, frantically browsing images uh, to find <laughs> out the differences right now. So <laughs> Frantically is the word. <laughs> Desperately. <laughs> Yeah, so I think that, yeah, I've already talked about, oh, it's a bit like Azul. And uh, it's a type of game that I really like to show to people that uh, are not much into uh, board games. These games where you pick tokens and then move them around on your board and score points. I think that uh, it's really, yeah, that's my favorite more well, newer board game play. Well, it's Azul, which doesn't end at the fifth round. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's nice to have these kind of 
games with this little tactile component of putting stuff on a board. Um, that's a big part of the reason why Tiny Towns is my like introductory game of choice. Is you're putting stuff onto a little board, and Tiny Towns is my like introductory game of choice. Is you're putting stuff onto a little board and collecting things. And here we go, Tiny Towns. We have to talk about it someday. Uh, we I have want. no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Okay, so we have our. <laughs> okay, so we have our fill of shining stones for today. No, I still want more stones. Do we have more? We have more. I we think have we have more. another game with some more shiny stones. Uh, so, Kara, would you like to tell us all about it? Um, well, it doesn't any dice. Uh, the, the... Ah! Um, we we have shells too. Oh yeah, right, and shells, shiny shells. Everyone um, knows that dice are gems of the tabletop and shells are the gems of the beach. So, sold by the seashore. <laughs> so anyway, um, we are talking about Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef and has been on Kickstarter before. Um, it's a one to four player game by the Eisner brothers, Tim and Ben, with art and world building by Mr. Cuddington. Um, and uh, published uh, by Druid City Games and Skybound Games, um, and Skybound Games, um, the world building part is kind of important here because it's um, on the co box cover. It says on the bottom part one, and a lot of people are confused. Part one of what? Um, they do plan to release more games and also a what? Um, they do plan to release more games and also a tabletop RPG that is set in this world. So um, with the collector's edition, you also got an art book with a lot of background story and a map of the world and everything. So they do really plan to uh, really plan to uh, make a lot there. So what is Tidal Blades Heroes of the Reef? It's a worker placement uh, dice building game where you uh, control a um, wannabe hero that comes to the islands and um, out of the fold, like a space-time rift that uh, is near these islands and from time to time monsters come out and that's not good. So they need people to fight these monsters. Um, <clears throat> and you um, travel these islands uh, in a worker placement fashion, um, get uh, shiny shells or uh, fruits and you can also visit one of the free arenas and do a challenge there because how do the heroes get chosen by competing in challenges in arenas while everyone is watching and trying to impress the judge so um, these challenges are where the dice come into play. so um, these challenges are where the dice come into play um, every challenge has a couple of symbols you need and um, you decide how many dice you want to roll um, roll them, uh, try to match the symbols on the cards. Uh, you can re-roll as often as you want, but with every roll you also have to roll a danger die. You can re-roll as often as you want, but with every roll you also have to roll a danger die. And if this die shows a red X, you have to lose a die. Yeah, I think um, that that die is, is made exclusively of red X's. Uh, yes, it has, it has blank spaces, um, so there is a chance you won't lose dice, um, but um, there are also three different types. The longer the game goes, um, the more difficult it becomes. Uh, so in, with the last die, you also can roll double X's and lose two dice. Um, but that's where the shells come in to um, pay a shell, you can block one of these X's and not lose a die, which is bad for a dice building game. <clears throat> hey, hey, I'm, I'm so. really sorry to interrupt the flow. I really need to just check. Is one of the characters a red crocodile? Yes. Is that what I'm seeing here? Yes. Oh my God, I need this role playing game. <laughs> that, that's kind of a frog too. What? Yeah, a they're... crocodile frog? I mean, no, is no, it no. a frog crocodile? I mean, that's important to know. No, I, th I think they are two characters. Oh. I mean, if 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 we were talking about the characters right now, the judge is a like an elder turtle. Um, we have a red crocodile as one of the like an elder turtle. Um, we have a red crocodile as one of the heroes. We have an axolotl 
as one of the heroes, which is my favorite. <laughs> the axolotl, so not a frog. Yeah, um, I mean, we also have on a frog. Vibes uh, when you say the turtle. <laughs> the, um, there is an expansion for five players and... Turtle. <laughs> The, um, there is an expansion for five players and it comes with a frog um, hero and then two humanoids. I think one of them is actually a human and the other one has like kind of fishy features a little, um, but still pretty humanoid, uh, the heroes you have. <clears throat> And um, yeah, and um, like that's basically the core of the game, um, moving around in a worker placement fashion and um, doing these challenges and um, with your dice. But there are also the monsters. I mean, you are not yet a hero, but you, if you want to be the hero, then you are probably fighting monsters, right? And um, so- That's your internship. Yeah. So uh, there are monsters, you don't have to fight them, but if you don't find them, fight them, chances are people won't like you as much. Um, and uh, that's part of scoring in the end, how, uh, that's part of scoring in the end, how much people like you. It's the championship board um, where you compete um, with the others over, you know, um, how much uh, people and the judge uh, are impressed by you. And if you fight monsters, people are more impressed by you. <laughs> I do read monsters, people are more impressed by you. <laughs> I do really like the uh, the fact that if you don't participate in the combat, you will lose points. But even if you uh, knock a few HP off the monster, then it will be considered to be enough. I think that's a neat mechanic. I didn't when we played, uh, <laughs> and I thought that uh, fighting the monster was uh, a bad idea, but actually it's... It's always interesting to to fight it, and it's kind of a team effort because if the monster is defeated, everybody that uh, fought it will get something back in recurrent turn. Yeah. So basically, I mean, fighting monster, you will lose, so you can't keep any of those dice, uh, which is pretty discouraging. But um, as Alex just said, it isn't about you don't have to kill the monster, just fighting it, basically showing people, hey, I do fight for you. I mean, the monster still lives, but I tried my best, is enough for the people to not. And actually, the, the dice mechanic is pretty smart. I think that you start with white die, but you can evolve them, you can upgrade them in two different directions, like uh, towards the red symbols and towards the blue symbols, and you can specialize them, go back uh, unless you lose that die, right? Exactly. So um, there are four levels of dice. The first one basically has all four different symbols on it, then a question mark, which is a joker, and a blank side. So you can roll all four symbols in the game with this. Um, and then you have to, if you level it, that up, color, as you said, red or blue. Um, red die have uh, the yellow and red symbol, while the blue dice have the blue and green symbol. And um, they become better with the third level and with the last level you can specialize them even more so there are four different dice in the line focusing on one symbol so um yeah yeah th that part is very smart also because i usually don't don't like when you have to do stuff to uh, stack your dice and then your dice could betray you because basically you are working hard to make some luck based so th that evolution puts thing, uh, things in perspective and that's uh, i think a very very cool and smart mechanic yeah um there's also like every character has four different stats uh, which correspond to these symbols you can roll in challenges and every time you match, match a symbol in a challenge you increase your stat of that symbol by one and these stats for example determine how many dice you are allowed to roll um, during a challenge or at the end of a turn, how many dice you get to refresh and upgrade and uh, stuff like that. So that's another aspect. So it's not like an upgrade and uh, stuff like that. So that's another aspect. So it's not like, okay, I just have to do any challenge. You can look at your different challenges on hand and decide, okay, I could do this one, but this one would actually give me skill points that I actually need so i will prefer the skill points that i actually 
need so i will prefer to do this challenge now um, so yeah that's uh, there's a lot of different things that work together also with fighting the monsters uh, you can become stronger by competing completing certain challenges beforehand and um, yeah it's i really like to completing certain challenges beforehand and um, yeah it's i really like the game and one thing i should definitely have to mention i play a lot of solo games and with many games I play them once in solo and it's fun and I never play them again in solo because I don't feel inclined to, you know, that's fun and I never play them again in solo because I don't feel inclined to, you know, set them up again. Uh, this game I've played multiple times in solo. Um, it, yeah, it's one of the few games I enjoy playing often. <laughs> yeah, and by looking to set it up. Yeah, a little. I mean, it doesn't... <laughs> people are uh, pretty impressed or confused uh, by looking at its setup because it doesn't have one board. It has, uh, let me think, five boards? Yeah, six boards if you count the championship board, seven if you count the expansion board. Also important to mention there are two versions. There's the Deluxe Edition that was uh, available during the Kickstarter and the Retail Edition you don't lose out on anything if you get the retail edition. The deluxe edition has simply, you know, it has miniatures and a set of standees. It has a totally needless dice and that increases the box size to a ridiculous amount. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you're it... saying that if any of us wants the Axolotl minis, they have to go for a Kickstarter editions uh, at second hand? Uh, I think so. I do believe I don't think the Adelix edition. I think so. I do believe. I, I don't think the Adelix edition is available in retail. It's not. I, I was looking. It's almost as big as the Kingdom Death box, by the way. Ugh. Oof. Yeah, I remember when I had a, a friend that pledged for it and that got their copy. Yeah, I remember when I had a, a friend that pledged for it and that got their copy and they were showing uh, it on the table and I was like, wow, that's huge. And uh, I will say that when uh, you know what the game is about, that doesn't seem that huge anymore because as you are doing some... Uh, fun, fun fact, I could uh, close my two-year-old kid when he was two-year-old inside the box of Kingdom Death. <laughs> Did you do it? <laughs> yeah. Do we have to call child services? Yeah, that, 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 that's that's my cool father, my father of the year award. Hey, hey, my child, look, I got you this black <laughs> box. It's your coffin. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it was kind of a prank to the mother, so it was fine, I, I guess. I, I, I hope so, Francesco, please forgive me. How many nights did you sleep on the couch for that? <laughs> did you sleep on the couch for that? It, it, it was either uh, the whole of Kingdom Death or a new crib. <laughs> yeah, when money is tight, you can use a Kingdom Death or Tidal Blades box. Yeah. Um, <laughs> jokes aside, I really liked uh, the game. I thought it was very interesting. Uh, I, I really liked uh, the game. I thought it was very interesting. Um, you have to be constantly looking into ways to regenerate your dice or to get new ones because it's very easy to lock yourself out of actions and to uh, quote unquote lose a turn because you weren't able to do a choose too many die or you didn't uh, focus enough. What's really interesting is that each character really has different abilities and they are all really interesting to to use and if you play your strength you can get uh you can get pretty strong and it seems very fun and interesting that way. The first game should definitely be considered a learning game. Um especially the first turn. Um if you haven't played the game before, you are sitting there, you are looking at these five or six different islands where you could go and do stuff and you have no idea what to do. Um, but from the second game, what your options are and what makes sense. So um, that's something to keep in mind. If you try the game, try it two times. Yeah, um, I, I really enjoyed it. It's definitely the kind of game where, speaking of uh, decision paralysis, uh, this game can have a game where, speaking of uh, decision paralysis, 
uh, this game can have that because of the, the dozens of options that you have for what you can do this turn. Um, but yeah, that's that's definitely a game that I that I liked. They are not going to get me unless they release those miniatures separately. I'm already fed up with my Takedo. They are not going to get me unless they release those miniatures separately. I'm already fed up with my Takedo copy missing one set of miniatures. I, I, I'm not having another game with super cute miniatures and I can't paint them. So uh, I love the sound of this game. I was already quickly looking to see if my local stockists had it and they just have the standee version. So, mm. Yeah, I mean, cute figures are just a way to get to your heart. <laughs> no worries, Ben. We can play the role-playing game. Uh, as long as I can be a crocodile. A really stupid crocodile. <laughs> I, I, I don't, you, don't, you have no idea how stupid I want him to be. <laughs> I want him to have trouble with a door. It's a crocodile. How do you want it not to have trouble with opening a door? Uh, true, true. I mean, you can just walk through them, maybe. You know, just ignore... I think that would be a troublesome quirk to have on a character if every time you entered a room you just splintered the door by walking <laughs> through it. It'd be a funny running joke, but because all the NPCs would ever have to react to it in a variety of different manners, it's probably not worth it. I'd rather just have a top hat with a squirrel inside. Right. Well, uh, that was Tidal Blades, and I really love the sound of that world. Um, and like I said, Tidal Blades, and I really love the sound of that world. Um, and like I said, I would have already slammed that game into uh, into my shopping basket if um, if it, they just retailed the miniatures somewhere. Um, I know that sounds a bit weird, but uh, in this particular case, it was the miniatures I was looking at. The uh, <laughs> this particular case, it was the miniatures I was looking at. The, uh, <laughs> while we were talking um, and they're gorgeous but we're not yet done with gemstones we've got one final little game um, in to, to squeeze in here it's actually two games but don't worry they're just reskins this is from the designer of movement games it is Emerson Matsuuchi um, he's a fantastic designer and interestingly this is also a part one in an experiment or a series. In this case, Emerson wanted to create a trio of games that you could play separately or you could put together in any combination. Um, and then there are two versions of them. So this is Century Spice Road or the far superior Century Golem Edition, which is way sexier and has gems instead of spices and don't accept any alternative substitutes. Never. So it's a super simple game that plays a bit like Slender. Game that plays a bit like Slender. Um, you have two decks of cards and some gems or spices. I'm going to talk about gems from now on because, as I just mentioned, uh, and you are like a gem trader. And essentially, the game's very simple. You shuffle up the two rows and you set up columns. Essentially, the game's very simple. You shuffle up the two rows and you set up columns from left to right. Or rows from left to right of uh, of these cards. One lot has point scoring cards on it. The other has like action cards. And on your turn, you just do one thing. And this thing can be you play a card from your hand. It might give you more gems. It might give you more gems. It might upgrade your gems um, because gems are worth increasing amounts. There's four different colors of them, and they're more valuable as you progress up the colors. Um, Yellow being the least valuable because who really wants a gem that looks that colour? All the way up to a nice pinky red. Uh, little cups that you... Both versions have like loads of ridiculous storage and play aids that you pull out of the box. Yeah, production value is uh, out, of the, out, of, out of scale. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, or you can play trading cards that let you trade in somebody who's good at trading. You'll always make a better deal and improve your situation. The other thing you can do is you can acquire a merchant card, which you look at the merchant card row and you can pick up the one on the far left for no cost. If you want to pick up any of the ones further along, you have to do the same thing as you do in Canvas, which is you have to put a gem on the previous card and gradually like you take those cards later. It's a nice mechanic. I always love it in games with a shop deck like this. Because otherwise you end up the way that Binding of Isaac Four Souls does, where there's two cards on the table nobody wants and everyone's just drawing blank cards off the top of the deck and hoping. So it's good that you increase the value of the cards uh, just so people go, oh, I'll, t 
Or you can claim a point card, which is the main mechanism of winning. You trade in a certain number of gems, you take a card. If you've taken the first or second card, you get some bonus money, which makes the um, those points cards a bit, bit more valuable. So again, it's a mechanic to encourage you to take stuff that maybe people are ignoring. All of the cards you've played and put them back in your hand. So that is like, you're trying to gather cards up and play them and get this little engine going. And then once you're happy with it, you go, okay, well, I played everything I want to. I'll rest. I'll take all my cards back and boom, I'll go again. It's very simple. It's very light. It plays a bit like Splendor. Um, if you have Splendor, only if you already have, only if you want to get the other ones in the series, the other two Century games. Um, the other thing to note is this is the only one of the Century games that goes to five players, which is um, a bit weird. All the others stop at four players. Um, so obviously changed his mind a bit there. Uh, game end, the, somebody has gotten their fifth card or sixth card in lower player counts. And uh, everyone gets equal number of turns and you're done and you total up your points. It's really simple. It's really pretty. And honestly, uh, it's uh, such a, a wonderful endeavor. Like I'm not, I've not got. Uh, it's uh, such a a wonderful endeavor. Like I'm not, I've not got too much more to say about Century Golem Edition or Century Spice Road, but I will have more to say in future episodes when I get onto Eastern Wonders and a New World and how they combine back into others. So this one's just a nice, light, easy buying. So this one's just a nice, light, easy buying simple engine game. So, Fen, I, I feel like you haven't been very clear about it, but with the two versions, Golden Edition Spice Road, which one do you recommend? I have both. I gave the Spice Road set to the parents with lights so I can look at them. So, obviously, I recommend the Spice Road set. <laughs> <laughs> because otherwise you ha wouldn't have given it to your parents, of course. Obviously, not at all. Uh, so, um, well... Uh, in truth, originally the Golem edition was just going to be like a, a convention edition and people loved it so much because it has this fun fantasy world that you don't usually see where everyone does everything with the help of these giant golems. And it's just a bit more engaging than another game about trading spice. Mm. And uh, I, I have to say this game uh, it, it has one thing over Splendor, which is uh, Splendor over Splendor which is uh, Splendor. Uh, I end up always angry when playing a lot of players in Splendor because it's way too random. The fact that you build your engine with cards and you have the rest action actually gives uh, Century... Uh, build your engine with cards and you have the rest action actually gives uh, Century uh, 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 quite more depth. So if you are the kind of guy like me who gets angry at Splendor because it's random, Century is a better play in this regard. And I better play in this regard. And I know that I am saying something important because a lot of people love Splendor. So that's it. That's my opinion. Yeah. Uh, oh, I am actually very excited about getting to talk about the other two games further on in this because you just met, reminded me how An Endless World, New World is its other name, has one of my favourite worker placement mechanics ever. So um, you can expect to hear about that one in a few episodes down the line. But I just love to say I, I thoroughly recommend the Century series. You can just pick them up one at a time. You can play Century Golem Edition by itself. You can play Golem Edition with an Entins, or you can play Eastern Mountains with an Endless World, or you can play all three of them stuck together. And the amazing thing, every single one of these games has just one A5 double-sided sheet with examples. That's how simple these games are. They're fantastic little filler games. Uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Fantastic little filler games. Uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And I just, I can't recommend it enough. It's it's really accessible. That sounds like a pretty great uh, size package. Yeah, although they're designed to be stored upright. These Century Spice Road ones. They're designed to be stored upright. These Century Spice Road ones have a lovely artwork that all combines to build a full tableau picture. Um, the Golem ones don't do that. If you do store them upright, the components kind of escape occasionally, which is a bit frustrating. So I keep them on their side. 
the very special shrine that I didn't For make the golem up. edition. Yeah, yeah, the golem edition, yeah. <sighs> so it, it sounds like it's language independent because I'm looking right now where I can get it. And so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the uh, the ones with, of the, uh, with the parents are um, English, Swedish and English. It's just the rules. And you can teach people the rules within two minutes or so. Okay, great. I didn't like Splendor. I have uh, to say... I do do tell us why. We've got a little bit of time. I, I think I already said that someday and that it was at a convention like maybe six years ago and that I don't really remember why. Uh, <laughs> so, But uh, I have evolved since then and I think that I would be more likely to give... Uh, to give... Um, ah! I would be more likely to give century. I would be more likely to give century, uh, whichever one, uh, a try and just keep Spender in the in the in the back. Um, but yeah, because I mean, uh, we said something in French. We say "y'a que les idiots qui changent pas d'avis," uh, which in French we say "y'a que les idiots qui changent pas d'avis," uh, which basically means only idiots don't change their minds, and. That's very wise words. Uh, we, we are sometimes wise. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, I just shared a little picture of the insert and everything and the little gem trays. You'll notice and each yeah. one is a small Wonderful. individual diamond. Yeah. It is uh, it is a really beautiful, wonderful, um, engaging set of games. And um, I, I plan to talk about Eastern Mountains next time we... Uh, we get together and chat because uh, that's a really fun pick up and deliver game. Looking forward to it. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I might uh, give it yeah. a try because it looks really, really nice. Y you all look enthusiast. Ooh. My wallet is not looking forward to it, but uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, the one edition and then suddenly find out a couple of years later they've released the Century Golem Edition set and just be like, I could never get these because I don't go to conventions, but oh my god, now I'm going to buy them all and I really wish I had all the bonus cards as well. Yeah, I'm definitely not like that. I never buy promo cards. About that, I, I absolutely have to go to a convention uh soon enough because i i have to get um, mind management uh, easter egg but we, we will have time to talk about this in future episodes yeah. yeah okay so on for in this episode you can catch us over at www.patreon.com forward slash the last standy or as the last standy on twitter until next time we have been the last standy so goodbye from alexis Goodbye. Audrey. Bye bye. Alessio. Bye. Cara, second E in standee is for eleganza. <laughs> <laughs>